Howdy folks, welcome to part two of the Rotten Ranger Revival. Last time we got it running and driving. It runs good and it drives sort of okay-ish. Good enough that I think we can start to slowly dial back the sketchiness. The tires are shot, the brakes are shot, the parking brake cables are broken, the transmission sounds like it's full of broken marbles. So yeah, let's throw some more parts at it. Well, let's get a look at the soft underbelly of this truck. Emphasis on the word soft. It looks good from a distance, but 35 years of a high salt diet has not been kind to it. It looks like when they painted it, they sprayed the bottom kind of rocker section here with spray and bed liner material, and then it just rusted and bubbled up underneath of it. So this is still pretty solid. It just looks, looks like crap. Looks like the original spare tire with the original Air tire mount, even has the old lock tumbler there. Of course the chain's rusted in half. I'm sure it's been a long time since that worked. Tailpipe's pretty crusty, but I think the muffler's good. It's had some exhaust work done. Looks like all new brake lines to the rear axle. See the ones going out to the wheel cylinders have been replaced. And then they ran a new piece up there in the frame rail. But we're gonna have to do something about this hose. The brackets rusted off. And then the vent tube for the rear axle. She's, uh, she's not working anymore. There's the parking brake cables that are both broken. The spring's also broken. I can't get the spring, so we're gonna have to come up with something for that. Looks like the filler neck's been replaced with a rubber one. And it's kinked. So that's fun. See, they just chopped a hole in the floor of the box to put that on. Can't say I blame them, looking at that skid pan for the fuel tank. I don't know, the bolts look okay for the fuel tank strap, so I bet you could have got that out of there. Borg Warner transfer case, the four wheel drive does work. Frame's getting pretty thin. I noticed especially right here, she's getting pretty thin. Brake hoses are looking pretty scary, but somebody's put pads on it. Got lots of pad. Uh, the dust shields are all shot, so I'll probably just rip those off. Yeah, the front tires are completely smoked. They're also from 2003. This Ford twin I-beam suspension, it rides nice, but it's really hard on front tires. And I would love to know the story behind this white powdery residue. Looks like a fire extinguisher to me. I don't know what could have caught on fire in this area, but I think they, uh, I think they unloaded on it. Yeah, bottom of that door is pretty crunchy. But the biggest problem is the cab floor. She's running the structural floor mats. That's carpet right there. And then the driver's side is significantly worse. That's the rubber floor mat. And then the last guy slapped in some aluminum sheets there. Just glued them in with some caulking. Pretty typical. All right, folks, time for a trip down memory lane. They don't make brakes like this anymore, that's for sure. Well, the caliper setup's pretty wild compared to what we see nowadays. But instead of a slide pin, it has these wedges with a piece of rubber in the middle. Actually works pretty good, I think. Yeah, so the brake hoses are pretty crunchy, but these are made from a lot thicker steel than the regular brake lines, so they can take a whole lot more abuse. 
Well, the trickiest part of this whole job is getting this circlip off. I'll show you how I do it. I just take two pry bars and I come in underneath the wheel studs and then make sure you swept the floor because this thing's going to go flying. Maybe not. Maybe we can do it a little bit more civilized way. Like so. And then that guy will come off. Then there's a needle thrust bearing. And then you need a special socket for this nut, which I just happen to have. And there's a keeper. And the second nut. Yeah, the seal stayed on the axle. Come on. There you go. Well, like I said, brake pads are in pretty good shape. There's lots of meat left on them, but they're they're getting pretty rusty. The brake shoes look good, plenty of meat, but you see how the paint's all wrinkled up and it's peeling off like burned skin? That means the wheel cylinder's leaking brake fluid and the brake fluid has attacked the paint. So we're going to have to replace the wheel cylinder. I mean, you could rebuild it, but they're so cheap, we'll just replace it. The other side's actually quite a bit worse. Otherwise, there's really nothing wrong in here. The cable for the adjusters even there, usually those are broken. Looks pretty good. This little guy is the parking brake strut. That's what the parking brake lever here pushes against in order to open up the brake shoes. And it has a little oval shaped spring that fits on one end, keeps it from rattling around in there. And they're always broken. And for whatever reason, Ford doesn't include that with the spring kit that you buy. So just keep that in mind. And I don't know if you can buy that separately, but you can buy the whole strut kit. Look at that. There we go. It's a pretty good day when they come apart without cutting. Of course, the fact that there's no fluid coming out is a little bit discouraging.
Here we go. I cleaned off these little pads that the shoes rub against. Put a little grease on those. I installed the new parking brake cable. It hooks in like so to the rear shoe. Yeah. I'm gonna have to pull that cable out a little bit just to make this easier for us. We did get a new spring with the hardware kit. And that's a good deal. So simple, so, so simple. Jeepers. Guess that's it. I'm a little bit out of practice on drum brakes, I guess. see them too often anymore. Alright guys, I think we're done. I was having a hard time with the adjuster spring. It's because my brake spring pliers are backwards when I'm working on this side of the truck. It wants to hook over the top of the spring and then I can't get it into the little slot. On the opposite side, the little hook's the other way and it's a lot easier. Anyway, I think it's right. There's white springs and green springs in the kit. The last guy who did this job had the white springs over here and the green springs over on the other side, so I did the same thing. I think they're actually the same. The springs are bent the same, or they're close enough that it doesn't really matter. The cable's routed correctly, so it should work as well as they ever work. Yeah, I believe this is a Bendix brake design. This is old school stuff. So you have a primary shoe and a secondary shoe. The primary shoe has a shorter lining and that always goes towards the front. And these brakes are kind of biased so that they work better going forward than they do going in reverse. So the wheel cylinder spreads the shoes and then this primary shoe here, its job is kind of to help intensify the pressure on the secondary shoe because the whole, this whole assembly is going to kind of rock back against this one anchor point at the top. And then when you engage the brakes going in reverse, the opposite happens. The whole thing kind of rocks the other way and this shoe moves away from that anchor point at the top. That tightens the cable right here for the adjuster. And if the shoe, theoretically, if the shoe moves too far, it pulls the cable up and then it ratchets onto the adjuster and adjusts that as needed. It sounds great, but it rarely works in our climate. So typically the, the only adjustment they get is the manual adjustment that we're going to do when we set them up. Anyway, I think we're okay. I got the brakes machine, the, the drums machined. Yeah, we're good. Well, I don't think these dust shields are going to make it. I appreciate the uh, little air scoop they put on there though. High performance braking. Look at that. All 
I machined the rotor, repacked the bearings. We're going to install a new grease seal using the factory approved seal installation tool. Be sure to tell me in the comments that nobody machines rotors anymore, that it's a waste of time, that the new brake rotors don't have enough material to machine them, and blah, blah, blah. The locking hubs, I gave them an aerosol overhaul, and then there's an O-ring on the inside that's supposed to keep the water out. The old ones were in pretty tough shape. I didn't have the right one, so I made my own. I had some long three millimeter O-rings. I just cut a couple of them, cut a couple of them up and super glued them together. And that works surprisingly well for static applications. I wouldn't do that for a dynamic application like a piston seal or something, but for this it'll be just fine. Everything's clean. I've cleaned up the surfaces here for the brake pads and the slide pins. We are ready to install. Now one of the nuts has a little nub. That little nub has to face out. Now if you read the service manual, it's going to tell you to tighten this to 35 foot-pounds while spinning the rotor, back it off a quarter turn, then tighten it to 16 inch-pounds, which is basically zero, and then install the little keeper, put on the outside lock nut, and tighten that to 150 foot-pounds, and you should be good to go. But I'll tell you right now, that's going to be way too tight, so we're actually going to back this off. So we're going to tighten it by hand, we're going to back it off couple of holes on the little lock plate here and then we will install the outside nut and torque that to 150 foot-pounds. You have to have some end play on these bearings. The manual says one to three thousandths. Just right. That's good. We're about a thousandth and a half of end play. It should be perfect. I've had a lot of people kind of argue with me in the past about wheel bearing setup, telling me that it needs to have preload. I've never seen a wheel bearing that has to have preload. They almost always have to have some end play. And the reason is, think about the heat. As this thing breaks, it's going to get hot. And as it gets hot, it expands much more than the spindle. So you have to have some end play to account for that thermal expansion or else your bearings are going to get way too tight. I put a little grease on that flange just to, to hold off the galvanic corrosion. Uh, there's a guy who watches my channel, Wayne P. He left me a comment telling me that there's supposed to be some retainers over top of the wheel studs that keep this thing in place. You can actually buy new ones, but I forgot to order them. So we're just gonna have to let it sit there. It is a little awkward, because every time you pull the wheel off, this thing falls off and then you've got exposed bearings. Just make sure these little tabs fit down into the slots in the caliper. All 
All right, we need wheels and tires. Looks a little better, don't you think? The outside wasn't too bad, but the inside was a rust horror show. So I spent about two hours hunched over the sandblast cabinet like Quasimodo. Then I hit him with some aerosol rejuvenation spray. The color is whatever I had on the shelf. I'm sure it's not right, but it's close enough. <laughs> That was a crap duster, by the way. transmission this is a Mitsubishi FM 145 transmission it's supposed to have 8090 gear lube in it and somebody filled it with automatic transmission fluid which is typical for these Fords of this vintage that they have the Mazda transmission those all use ATF but this guy does not the good news is there's no metal on the plug so we don't have anything catastrophically wrong I don't think I went ahead and threw four new tires on it Originally this would have had 195, 75, 15s. As far as I can tell, that, that tire size no longer exists. So they recommended I go with the 205, 70, 15. They're super cheap. These are hand cooks made in the USA. 60 bucks a piece, my cost. But there's, there's not a lot of options. They only had two, two tires available. One was a brand I never heard of and then these. So if you want to get a fancy tread pattern or something, Good luck. I wanted to throw some big mutters on it, but it's already geared so stinking high, I think it would just be, it would make the problem even worse. All right, the transmission is full of 8090 gear lube. My sales rep tells me this CarQuest gear oil is safe for yellow metals. I haven't seen anything on paper, but he tells me it is. Anyway, I just used this syringe style fluid extractor to shoot it in through the fill hole, because it's right there beside the frame you can't you're not going to be squeezing the bottle in there i also changed the engine oil and filter i also got the parking brake cables routed we'll have to adjust it but that's roughly where it's going to be and then i bent a new end on that spring so it's stretched a little tighter than it was originally but i think it'll work i ended up reusing the the long cable that runs up through the cab it's still in pretty good shape I just replaced the two out to the wheels. I went ahead and gravity bled the wheel cylinders. This truck does not have ABS, so it gravity bleeds pretty well. That should be good enough. If it's not, we'll, we'll do it the hard way. All right, we need to adjust the brakes. So we're gonna crank this guy out until the wheel stops. There it is. All right, now that's too tight. I've got to back it off. But depending on how well the adjuster is working, you may not be able to back it off. Well, sometimes it's better if you reach in here past the adjuster and push that little ratchet paw plate to the side. And then you can back the, back the adjuster off. Because if it's working, which this one isn't, it should keep it from backing off. That's pretty good. Still want to be able to hear it dragging just a little bit. All right, folks, we are running out of things to do. Well, I take that back. We're running out of easy things to do to this little truck. I think I've got everything under the hood buttoned up. I went ahead and bought the correct Group 56 battery. 
which I had never heard of that size before, but it does fit better than the Group 24 that I had jammed in there. Got all the covers installed. This little guy here, I even found the original push pin was wedged down in the fender. And then the cover over the throttle body. The air conditioning does not work. It is still an R12 system. I don't think we're gonna mess with that. This is probably more of a winter truck than a summer truck. I had a couple of comments about the ignition module. Guys were saying that the black ignition module that was on that distributor was not correct for this truck. That's for a newer model. It's supposed to have the gray ignition module. I found this guy wedged down in that fender well where I found the same the push pin there. Uh, that looks like a lot of frustration there. So if you're not familiar with these Fords, the ignition module mounts on the distributor and there's actually a special tool to reach in there and get to those little screws. I think they're seven millimeter hex or something like that. Anyway, it's kind of a mother lover to get back in there and get the thing apart. Like on the 306, it's pretty easy because the distributor's on the side of the block. And like the five liters, the distributor's up in the front. Not so bad, but on these things, it's not fun. Anyway, I have purchased the correct gray ignition module and replaced that. So we should be good to go there. I guess we'll keep this one around for uh, the next guy or for the inevitable estate sale. My brake pedal's a little squishy. Squishier than I would like. I think we better bleed those wheel cylinders. Better than gravity bleeding. Unfortunately, my lovely assistant is off today. So we're on our own. I'll show you guys how to do a, a one-man brake bleed. Works pretty good. What I have here is just an old water bottle. Drilled a hole in the top and shoved in some tubing. And then I made this little hook out of a piece of old brake line. Works pretty good. Let's me hang it up on the frame rail or whatever. And then this end here is off of one of those vacuum brake bleeder units. The ones that everybody always tells me I need but don't actually work. It works good for this. So the trick here is you need the tubing to come out of the bleeder and then go up. So I just looped it over top of the leaf spring. We're going to crack the bleeder loose. Like so. Twist that guy up. Now I'm going to give the pedal a couple of pumps and we should push some fluid through. We're not going to know how much or how much air is there. Looks like there's still air coming through there, isn't there? Better give it a couple more pumps. That looks better. Now if you just pinch this hose while you pull it off, it won't get brake fluid everywhere. Okay. There we go. It's not very scientific, but it does work pretty well. Oh yeah. That's what we wanted. feel bad but it's a little tight for me too all right we'll release our parking brake which is currently holding us and we'll slowly roll away Yeah, we'll throw some Illinois Farm Fresh gas haul in it. Because I really don't know how long it's been sitting. 
I would guess longer than a few months, which is what I was told. Hump up. has to be in the counter shaft so we're in third gear right now if we go to fourth gear it's totally silent and I believe in fourth gear it's direct drive so you're not using the counter shaft that'll be fun to fix well, he must have smelled a bunny is not a not a powerful engine but this truck's so light and it's been weight reduced things pretty snappy all right guys that's all I have time for this week it runs it drives it stops I mean other than the Flintstone floorboards it's not a bad little truck I'm not sure if there'll be a part three or not if I know anything about transmissions it's that uh, a noisy transmission will not self-correct so chances are we're gonna have to pull that guy out Maybe it's a counter shaft bearing or something. Who knows? But I don't have the energy to do it right now. It's gonna be sometime in the future. Anyway, thanks for watching. And yeah, I'll see you next time. They took Basically everything that was good about the 4 liter pushrod engine, they flushed that down the drain and they gave us this, which I believe is the worst engine that Ford's ever made, the 4 liter single overhead cam V6. It's actually basically the same block as the pushrod engine, but they converted it to single overhead cam by replacing the normal camshaft in the valley with an idler shaft and adding two more timing chains, one at the rear on the, driver's, or the passenger side one at the front on the driver's side. The problem is they get to about 150,000 miles and they start to break timing chain tensioners, especially on the passenger side at the rear. And there is no way to replace the timing chains on this engine without removing it from the vehicle.